So today we're going to look at the brand new Fujifilm X-T2 mirrorless camera. And this camera's been making a few waves online with several bloggers reporting that they're getting very nice results from it, which uh, is aided by Fuji's extensive background in colour and uh, film stock. So, uh, but before we get to that, let's let's say what this isn't, and that's this isn't a full review of the camera, and that's because this is a pre-production model. It's not the finished article. Uh, anything that you've seen online thus far will have been from a pre-production camera, and the image quality that you are seeing on this camera may not be the same image quality that you're going to get on the final article. And for that reason, we're not going to do a deep examination of what that image looks like just yet. I think it's much safer to wait for the production model to come through with the finished production uh, version 1 firmware um, and then we'll have a real good idea of what it looks like. Um, but uh, all I can say is what we've seen so far is reasonably promising and um, um, we should probably uh, leave it at that. So let's get on to the things that we can look at and uh, let's look at the hardware side of this camera. Now this is pretty much as the final model is going to be. It's got uh, a really nice body uh, it feels lovely and solid. It's, it, it's lightweight and yet solid. It uses the same sort of magnesium alloy, I think, as you'll see on a lot of uh, mirrorless cameras these days. Uh, but the grip is really nice. Um, now, you'll see that it's got a, a vertical grip on here, and that's not just so you can shoot photos upright. Um, it has uh, two batteries inside. Uh, you can run it um, using just those two batteries or you can uh, you can also have a third battery in the camera itself as a sort of backup so that the combination of all three batteries together will give you quite a long shoot time but that's not the main reason for a videographer versus a stills photographer to buy the grip um, the one thing that you'll see that's missing from the main camera itself is the headphone jack there is no headphone jack in this camera um, which is a sort of a bit of a bit of an omission. So what they've done instead is put the headphone jack here inside the grip, which um, is slightly strange. But anyway, it's good good to have one rather than not. It does have a meaning you need to buy the grip. Um, in addition to that, you get a DC power input, which allows you to power the camera for much longer periods of time. But also, the grip allows you to record longer run times in the camera. So the camera without the grip can only run for 10 minutes or thereabouts. With the grip, it goes up to 29 minutes, 59 seconds, which is the limit for European tax reasons for a mirrorless camera to um, record uh, unless you unless the company wants to end up paying a lot more tax. So they, they tend to restrict the, the run times to that. So uh, what else can we look at? Well, the viewfinder on this camera is frankly very, very good indeed. Uh, it's not as good as the Leica SL, which has an amazing uh, 4 million pixel viewfinder, I believe. Um, but this is, this is, I believe, the 2 point something million pixel uh, OLED EBF. Very clear, very responsive, um, and I don't think any problems there. The rear screen, which you can see here, uh, is, uh, is a rather strange contraption. It's not so bad. You can see it reasonably well in bright light. It's not perfect. It's, quite, it's shiny like most of these rear screens, uh, but it has a very strange flip-out mechanism. So you can not only just flip, flip it out, so if you're looking down from the top, you can also flip it out sideways. But I found if you just wanted to flip it out that way, it's actually really fiddly. Um, on the plus side, you can look slightly up at it and you can definitely look down at it. You can't flip it all the way around for a selfie. Um, so this hinge mechanism, it's fine. It's probably a little bit, I wouldn't say flimsy, but it's, it's probably a bit more dangerous <laughs> Than, than some of the other ones I've seen in terms of uh, if, you know, if you accidentally hit it while it was open, it, it might break. Um, but overall worth having, just I wish it wasn't this fiddly and frankly for video, you don't need it to flip uh, the other way unless you're doing a lot of vertical video for some fashion or some other reason. Okay, um, in terms of other controls, if you look at the top of the camera, you'll see that there's virtually no LEDs or, or push buttons to be seen. Everything is dial. Um, which is it's lovely, it's got a lovely tactile feel. Um, and you can set your ISO just using the dial here, you can set your shutter speed using the dial here. Now what's weird however is that the shutter speeds marked are, well weird for video at least, not for photography, is that the, the, sh the shutter speed dial is marked in regular shutter speeds. So 
you've got 15th, 30th, 60th, 125th, you'll notice that there's no 50th or 100th or the traditional shutter speeds that you might shoot video on, especially in PAL land. Um, so how do you get to a 50th of a second? Well, annoyingly, you have to set either a 60th or a 30th, um, and then you have to rotate the dial, which I've, I've customized it to be this dial on the front, can be this dial on the back if you prefer, um, and then you have to tweak it to get to a 50th, which is really odd. Um, and likewise, you can also get to it from uh, a 60th. Let me just go around to a 60th. So when the shutter speed is actually set at a 60th, the only the range I've got of shutter speeds that I can set using this dial is from a 40th through to a 100th and no more. Basically, only up to the next major setting on the dial. I mean, why I can't just go all the way through from the lower shutter speed to the higher shutter speed um, is, is beyond me. And it's something I hope that Fuji will sort out for the release version, uh, or if not, in a subsequent firmware update. So other things about the, the design of the camera, uh, it's got two SD card slots and you can record video to either one of them, but I'm told not to two simultaneously, which is uh, slightly annoying. Uh, I, I guess that's to do with processing. Um, other things, there is a mic jack, standard 3.5 millimeter mic jack in the camera. Uh, there, to control that, if you go into the menu, um, you can just drop down to the video functions like this and to mic adjustment level and there is a mic adjustment which goes through in stages from off all the way up to, let's see, 20. Um, pretty rudimentary, pretty much like most other, other video centric DSLRs out there. Uh, there's no option for a nice XLR pack like the Sony A7S or the A7R Mark II. Um, and there's certainly no XLR bolt-on pack for the bottom like the GH4. So this is, this is basic in that respect. Um, but if you add a, a regular mixer, something like this Tascam, um, you know, like the old good old days of 5Ds, you can make it work. It's just that, you know, you end up bolting everything together and it looks perhaps a little bit silly. Still, uh, the, you can work around that if you think that the image quality and the handling otherwise is worth it. Also on the back of the camera um, is the, the, the menu. So to go into it, you just press the menu button. Um, there's a dedicated video menu, as you can see. Um, I can shoot in 4K uh, in a lot of frame rates, actually 29.97, 25, 24, 23, 98. And then you can do full HD in in 1080 59.94, 1080 50, 1080 28.97, and 1080 25p. What there isn't is any super slow motion shooting, so nothing like the A7S Mark II or A7R Mark II, or indeed um, not even the 96 frames a second of the Panasonic GH4 on this camera. If you want slow motion, you're going to have to look elsewhere. This is very much a normal speed camera. Um, you can decide whether you want to output uh, your image. Um, to the SD card or to the HDMI. So if you want to record internally, you've only got the standard film profiles uh, or Fuji's, Fuji's own profiles. Uh, you can't record currently to log internally. Fuji say that's for quality reasons. They say that they want to restrict the um, use of log for 8-bit recording internally. They just don't think it's good enough. But the response from bloggers online probably means that uh, they will look to change that, I hope, um, so that uh, you can record 8-bit and log should you want to. Although I have to say I might actually agree with Fuji and that recording externally to a recorder like the Shogun is um, going to give you a better result if you want to shoot log. So other things in the menu, um, film simulations. Now you can shoot various different film simulations uh, on this camera. So let's, let's go ahead and try. Um, so currently it's in the standard setting. I'm going to hit, I'm going to focus up here. Um, and then you've got your Velvia film simulation. So a lot of these film simulations are based on uh, the popular Fuji stills film stocks, uh, Velvia being one of the ones which is nice and punchy um, and very popular with still photographers. Um, you've got Astia Soft, which as the name suggests is a softer version of that look. Um, you've got a classic Chrome. Uh, you've got a Pro Neg High, which as it says on the menu, is ideal for portrait and slightly enhanced contrast. You've got Pro Neg Standard, which is ideal for 
portraits with soft gradations and skin tones and you've got Acros black and white which is actually one of my favorite ones you've got standard monochrome and if you really want to go old school there's also sepia lovely isn't that nice the closest thing to uh, a flat mode i guess would be um, the astia soft mode and that's what i've been using um, you can tune these slightly, so you've got highlight tone there, shadow tone, colour, sharpness. I can knock down the sharpness a little bit, so I've got minus 4 to plus 4 there, so I could take that down. Likewise with uh, the colour, I could knock that down as well. Um, but there's no way to load in a, a, a custom profile and there's no straightforward cine gammas like you might find on a Sony or in the, indeed uh, the Panasonics. So in that way it, it's a little bit behind those cameras but what I think is interesting is just how nice those film emulation modes are. So certainly from Fuji's demo videos they published themselves uh, the, the look of those is pretty nice and the whole idea is that you don't have to spend an awful lot of time grading that uh, you know instead of the log mode where you you, you absolutely have to bring it into an edit suite and mess around with the colors and the contrast um, in terms of uh, just doing something quickly and making it look nice the film modes should do a very nice job but we'll have to wait and see with the finished article right lenses now Fuji use their own lens mount it's uh, the XF lens mount um, their, their lenses are pretty small and compact. There's a nice range. Some of them are very nice and fast. There's lovely fast primes, um, and there's a few zooms like this 18 to 55 f 2.8 to 4. Now, that's all well and good, um, but there's a big downside, that, and they're, they're all fly by wire. So for manual focusing, it's fly by wire. Uh, I can probably put it in there now. As you can see, it, it might take quite a few turns to get you anywhere where you actually want to be. Um, not. A great tactile experience. Um, on the plus side, by being fly-by-wire, you can actually change the focusing direction. So by default, they come the Nikon way, um, but you can just go into the menu, flip a, a couple of things, and it will then focus the other way, the Canon direction, the, the video camera direction, cine lens direction. The aperture. So on these, you've got a choice of uh, automatic aperture um, or a manual aperture, which is uh, it's going up and down there. Let's have a look. Okay, um, uh, but there's no way to de-click that on this lens. Maybe they'll bring de-clickable lenses in the future. And then this particular lens also has image stabilization. Now, it's worth noting that the image stabilization from Fuji is just in their lenses and just in selected lenses. Uh, if you put on a third-party lens, the chances are it won't have image stabilization. Um, and there's no stabilization in the body, unlike the Sony a7S II and R2. And if you do a lot of handheld work, that in itself might be enough to deter you from buying this camera. You can, of course, fit it to a rig, but ultimately it's not going to be as easy to get a stable shot with this as it is with the Sony a7S Mark II. Um, again, we'll see what happens in the future. Maybe Fuji will get that in the X-T3. Um, so the other thing about these Fuji lenses is that they, of course, have autofocus, and that autofocus is pretty good. Um, you can customize it to activate uh, using a push button. I've activated, I've put it onto this button here, um, and I'm just going to show you now. If Lillian looks at me, Lillian smiles. Okay, so I can now just by pressing this button engage the AF, and I go on the background, and back to Lillian. And it's pretty, it's pretty quick. And if I'm recording in camera, like now, unfortunately, I lose that functionality. Um, not perfect, but and certainly not the same as Canon's dual pixel CMOS AF in terms of its smoothness. Uh, but if you're just using it to get you into focus before a shot, uh, then it can work quite well. Um, now. If you want to take this lens off and use a Canon lens or a PL lens, whatever you can, um, let's pop that out. Uh, you can just there are a whole range of uh, reasonably inexpensive adapters like this Canon mount one, uh, which we just clip on, and then I can put on my rather nice Takina 11/16 cine lens with Canon fit. Um, and that will work. Now, the downside is that 
there are no electronic adapters like the Metabones um, Speed Booster or the Metabones Mark IV uh, for Fuji at the moment, which means that if you've got a, a regular electronic Canon lens, you're out of luck. You're not going to be able to control aperture. The, only, the best you can hope for is what people used to do and lock the, the, the aperture wide open or whatever aperture you want using various tricks and then using an ND filter, a variable ND filter to adjust the exposure. Um, far simpler, however, just to find a lens that actually has fully manual controls, you know, something like this, Samyang, I've got a whole lo load of lenses that do that. Uh, you could use uh, a Zeiss ZF Nikon uh, fit lens. Um, one other interesting option, bizarrely, is to use Sony Alpha lenses for their SLRs, which when you buy a mechanical adapter, you can actually get a manual iris with because you can get a little, little ring that, a little collar on the adapter that rotates and actually moves the iris blades. So Sony lens might actually be a better option for video with this Fuji camera than the Fuji default ones. Still, um, maybe Fuji in the near future will come up with video centric lenses in the same way that Sony have and let's hope that they do because at the moment the rest of the system is looking very promising. Um, other things that are slightly odd about this camera, so if you want to magnify your image to to check focus, um, you have to do it by pressing in this dial here, which is fine. So let me just punch that in. So it will punch in, and it's, it's, a, it's a good punch in too. The other thing, the other major downside to this is that if you wanted to um, check focus while recording, uh, it doesn't work. So like the 5D and the GH4, those cameras, if you, uh, if you are actually rolling, you, the, the push in to check focus doesn't actually do anything at all. Also, you can't change the ISO or white balance while recording either. Um, other settings, white balance is pretty straightforward. You can go in to your white balance settings, Kelvin here, and you've got a choice of automatic, a manual Kelvin value, which goes up in 100K um, increments. So there we go, 56. Let me just down a little bit. Uh, you can then fine tune that. And there's a lot more fine tune adjustment than other cameras. And that's, that probably comes from Fuji's extensive color background. You've got daylight, you've got cloudy, f different flow options, and even an underwater setting. Um, if, if you want to house this camera and use it underwater. So we'll put it back onto daylight for now. So one thing that is really odd is that there's a changing crop between the 4K mode and the 1080 mode. So let me just show you 4K now. So this is 4K. Um, and now if I then change that setting to uh, 1080, 59.94, and come out, the crop's changed. So you can see Put it back to 25p again and a different crop so i don't quite know why that is uh, i believe in the 4k it there is no pixel binning involved and um so i don't really know what's going on in the 1080 so to sum up this is a very promising camera from fuji it's certainly a very good first attempt at a, a true 4k serious mirrorless camera um, does it have all of the control options and the accessories that a Sony or Panasonic might have? Uh, no, not at the moment. Maybe that will change in time. Um, and some of the firmware and design things aren't quite perfect either, but maybe they'll be tweaked before the final production model comes out. So we'll see. But really what it comes down to is image quality. Is the image quality on this camera substantially better than those other cameras? And that's something we'll have to wait and see. So for now, that's all we can say. But hopefully in a few weeks time when we've got a production model, we'll be able to update you. Bye for now.